comentarles a, a Joseph, a Joseph Scherr, que yo lo describiría como una mezcla, un híbrido entre naturalista y artista, eh, pero finalmente a lo, no sé, a lo mejor pesa más la parte de artista, pero se ha dedicado mucho a, a tratar de no nada más ilustrar, sino generar nuevas tecnologías de, de expresión del de, de grupo en, en el que ha estado trabajando. Él es ahora, en este momento, él es director de un instituto de, de arte electrónico de la ciudad de Nueva York, que de hecho cofundó con otro colega y que dirige en este, en este momento y en donde él entrena a artistas y tiene estudiantes, pero además empezó su trabajo muy directamente aquí al recibir una, una de las becas uh, Fulbright, uh, García Robles, que en México y Estados Unidos pues, le comparte. Estuvo un largo tiempo en Hermosillo trabajando muy cercano a la Universidad de Sonora, pero también al, al grupo de ecología, del Instituto de Ecología, con Francisco Molina, que fue, digamos, su contacto de, 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 de mexicano en esa, en esa localidad y trabajó con las mariposas nocturnas, con las palomillas de Sonora, que es el proyecto realmente en el que ha estado trabajando desde 2010 eh, y que sigue trabajando en él, que empieza a completar probablemente eh, a lo largo del año siguiente estamos hablando de una gran cantidad de especies que están involucradas y que van a ver ustedes el tipo de, de información o el tipo de imágenes que él ha, él ha estado sacando Entonces, eh, no voy no, no, a describir la salud va a ser pero me impresionó muchísimo eh, este año en una en una reunión de, 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 de lo que se llama en inglés las Sky Islands, que es realmente todo el sistema madreano, que es decir, de la Sierra Madre Occidental, que ocurrió en Arizona, eh, él expuso parte de su material y a mí me impresionó realmente grandísimamente la, la calidad y la belleza. Estas, uh, estas imágenes, estamos platicando y su interés en, en esto me eh, llamó la atención y lo, le sugerí que por qué no vendría en alguna de las oficinas que estuviera en México, este, lo podríamos invitar a venir a la Ciudad de México y hiciera esta presentación el día de hoy. Eh, él realmente ha tenido una. una trayectoria muy amplia en el desarrollo de estas tecnologías. Él la va a explicar, no quiero adelantar cómo lo hace, eh, porque seguramente va a ser parte de su charla. Eh, en, ha tenido premios importantes eh, en Estados Unidos, eh, el premio Constant Stone de la, de la Fundación Constant Stone. Eh, el, State University de New York, Sony, le dio también un premio por el, la calidad de su trabajo este, en Nueva York y ha tenido varios premios, ha estado el, el libro que hizo, que es realmente me hizo un libro que me llamó muchísimo la atención, tuvo también un premio eh, nacional de diseño eh, editorial, que este, pues es muy apreciado en los Estados Unidos, ha estado dando conferencias en muchos lugares y exposiciones en Suecia, en China, en China ha estado eh, varias veces haciendo presentaciones y exhibiciones de su 
material, planos de secuencia. Eh, de tal manera que eh, realmente pues, es un currículo muy amplio. Eh, pues, no me voy a meter a, a describir, pues, sacar los puntos más importantes, creo que es más importante que eh, el uso del tiempo de, de la charla para su presentación. Pero, él está convencido y lo dice en su expresión como artista que hay que redefinir la relación entre la, la gente y la naturaleza ¿verdad? y darle realmente un valor muy alto a, a las especies y a los componentes de la diversidad biológica que ya los tomamos como parte pues, ni siquiera normal, ni siquiera lo conocemos, pero que no tiene este aprecio por un lado como seres vivos, pero luego, por otro lado como seres de la naturaleza que son imposibles de, de imitar y de mejorar. Y lo que él hace es tratar de enseñar estos, estos diseños de la naturaleza a la gente para que los aprecie, para que los valore y para que se acerque más a la, a la naturaleza. Eh, ha trabajado también mucho con mariposas nocturnas, palomillas en los Estados Unidos, en el, en el este de los Estados Unidos, pero una buena parte de su trabajo, creo que lo que va a ser más interesante, está saliendo de su trabajo en Sonora. La verdad que Joseph, if you want to start, va a hablar en inglés, porque su español es un poco, ni siquiera sonorense. Seguramente Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for having me here today, and uh, it's a pleasure to. I had the opportunity to meet uh, Dr. Sarkhan up in Tucson, which I believe he said. And I'll be speaking in English, which I think he also said uh, my Spanish is terrible. So, <laughs> so I apologize for that. I'm slowly learning, but I should learn much faster. Uh, I have been an artist um, for over 30 years and showing in museums worldwide and, and that. And I work across a lot of different mediums, but my background comes from drawing, painting, printmaking. And I'm a printmaker, so that would be woodblocks, etchings, uh, lithography. And that's still a big part of how I see my work, even though I moved into digital tools. I started working with moths uh, in 1997, so 14 plus years. Uh, I became attracted to them through a more poetic sensibility of what does a moth mean? Uh, coming to them, finding that they're attracted to light which should be in, in a lot of metaphors, to be attracted to light is to be attracted to knowledge. It is also uh, being attracted to the fire or the light is, becomes the fire. It's like Icarus who flew too close to the sun, burned his wings and fell back to earth, but through that we gain knowledge of fire. So I think it's a very powerful metaphor for what moths are as well as they're creatures of the night, mostly. There's a lot of day-flying ones, and some that fly both day and night. And uh, that's a powerful metaphor to me because uh, uh, moths are not considered attractive by many people. They're the ugly stepsisters to the beautiful day-flying butterfly. Uh, but people have a nightlife, and all the things that we do at night, from drugs, prostitution, nightclubs, raves, uh, all of that, we don't celebrate that. And so I come from, you know, being an artist and rebellious, going through, I was an early punk. I used to have many colors of hair, many earrings and things like that, but then became a responsible um, uh, university professor and uh, evolved into working with these wonderful creatures. Uh, it's hard to see in this slide, but I work with scanning technologies and uh, it's very different than a photograph that I'm able to get extremely high resolution, extremely large files, that I can print them in enormous size and that you can see every little bit uh, in focus and, and detail using uh, extended focus technologies. 
Um, so this is a beautiful little Thetarid moth that only flew one year in Sonora. I've been collecting there the summers for the last five summers, and I had this wonderful opportunity, I think, which uh, uh, Dr. Sarakhan mentioned of having a Fulbright uh, uh, Garcia Robles Award that I spent a whole year from 2010 in June to August of last year. And I just came back, and I've been working in Yekra uh, there this summer. Um, these funny moth images really took off when I started doing them. They have a quality and a detail that people have never seen. I print them up to nine feet tall and five and six feet wide on the very large ones. And as soon as I started doing them, my career took off. Uh, New York Times became interested in National Geographic, did a 16-page article. I started getting invited to go all around the world to Costa Rica to collect to you know, uh, Australia to collect, and then uh, eventually to Sonora. Uh, this is a show of where 100 uh, frame prints traveled to five museums in Sweden. They added one. Uh, and it was uh, a quite a successful show um, that they framed them. And at that time, uh, this has moths from Costa Rica, New York, some from Arizona, some from Sonora, and they're all mixed up. And it's earlier in my career before I really knew a lot of the taxonomy, and I was really more working with color, shape, and form of how I put things together. But now I know way too much, so the art side is being ruined because I know too much science and I can't do the <laughs> free things that I used to do. Another part of the aspect of the work is I print on a lot of different papers. And these are kind of unusual uh, prints in that this paper is Goli. It's from China. It's a handmade paper that they used for windows before glass was readily available. Uh, so it's translucent, light can shine through it, and the prints show up on each side. And these would be hung in the space. And these also have stereo card speakers in them. So I start work with the sound, and it's the sound of the moth shivering. In New York, it's much cooler, so the moths have to shiver to raise their uh, body temperature higher than the outside air in order to fly, but it makes this wonderful like uh, helicopter sound when you get it there with really high-res microphones, uh, kind of like a, I used to call it a rave trance kind of beat sometimes, <laughs> or the little ones make that high-pitched mosquito sound. So this is like a symphony of six different species and the sound they make from beating their wings, and it also has some ambient sounds of uh, wood frogs uh, from the spring and crickets and katydids more from the fall. So when you walk around this, there's this whole cacophony and symphony of sound, of uh, this amplified moth sounds, and uh, the sounds are for each species. That uh, translates to this next piece. Uh, this is from a little handmade uh, paper from uh, Yunnan, China, a town called Xi'an, and it's their local paper that they made, and I call this book, uh, piece uh, Moth Book in Three Chapters. It has about 300 images, and again, has a wide variety of moths from different places. A lot of these are Costa Rican moths right here. Is, this is, these two are Sonoran um, uh, and a few other places. And it has 20 channels of sound. And the sound moved um, uh, up and down and across. It was programmed to mimic kind of the flight of the moths. So uh, it went up walls. And depending on which museum or place it was showed in, that's how many uh, images would be revealed. So it was another multimedia piece. Another part of my work that I never expect is that I was um, uh, really uh, attracted uh, by the fashion world. The designers really loved my images. Uh, so uh, they kept calling me and they wanted images to work with. So one, uh, Alexander McQueen, very famous English designer who passed away a couple of years ago, um, used many of my moths in his evening gowns. Uh, this is one of the most fun shows I ever did. I've been in wonderful museums and that. These are the windows of uh, Bergdorf Goodman on Fifth Avenue, right across from the big Apple store. And there are these huge windows, and we did extra big prints. Some of these are almost 10 foot tall. Uh, and then we had the models dressed in very expensive uh, designer wear. More people saw that work from around the world than anywhere. That is a location where there's Arabs, there's Chinese, there's every language imaginable going by these windows. And it was great to see with everyone with their cell phone photographing it and just stopping and seeing what is this. So for me, it was my moment of biodiversity where 
more people saw moths and how beautiful they were than uh, any other show I had at any other kind of location. So it was really, really fun to do and it got a really great response. Um, so we, the, working with the designers there, they chose the clothing that they thought went well with the different moths and helped, uh, we worked out uh, the layout and the design. And that was up during uh, uh, a month and went through Fashion Week uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and then there's the more recent show that I just wanted to show. This was up in Hermosillo, the University of Sonora. And uh, of course, here's me with uh, my uh, good friend and sponsor for my Fulbright, uh, Dr. Francisco Molina, who uh, was just so invaluable for uh, uh, my year uh, in Sonora, helped me out of a lot of uh, uh, things and finding places to live and locations. And uh, so you can see kind of the scale of some of the prints. And so these prints were made for the size of the walls because of architectural elements. So I kind of changed them. And it also has a new element of caterpillar prints. Um, so I started working with caterpillars more recently and they're on a Japanese paper and they're, well, 16 by 20 inches where these other ones are really quite large. Um, this is also some new work. This was from last year at an exhibit at Colorado Springs in Colorado and it's six channels of video and I've been doing lots of HD video, um, and I have a clip that we have time to show later, um, of the uh, caterpillars eating. And ideally, I want to have a wall at some point with like 20, 30 monitors of all these caterpillars just munching on leaves and just have them as loops. So this was uh, really quite stunning and really kind of stole the show from the moth prints because everybody just went up to these to watch, to see the stunning detail that now is available in HD video that's just approaching the quality of the prints. So a little bit about Sonora and trying to do the work there. Um, to study moths in Sonora, there's so many different uh, ecosystems um, and, and places of, that moths are that are only in that location. So uh, this is El Pinacate. Well, you know, I'm sure you're gonna recognize a lot of these things with the lava flow. Uh, uh, the, the White Mountains in the background, um, very hot, very limited rainfall. Uh, but you know, there's a species of moss that'll be there that are nowhere else. The wonderful um, Cardone forests that are Kenyon Bay down to, to Wymus. Um, I, I love cactus too, and I have lots and lots of cactus images. And of course, Francisco's a columnar cactus person, so I went on many trips with him to see uh, really fabulous uh, things about cactus. And, all the photographs you're seeing, I can't do anything easy. So a lot of these are out of 30, 40 photographs stitched together. And even my caterpillar photographs are nine or 10 images stitched together inside of each other in extended focus. So I don't know how to do anything simple. Uh, to the beautiful cactus forest, which is, uh, that I was very fortunate to spend half of my grant at down in Las Bocas, the Pitaya, which is just, uh, I don't know, when I felt, saw it for the first time, my heart fell out. I, this is one of the most beautiful places, and even though it's very hot, and that, I just, that density of the cactus, I just love being there and walking through that uh, area and taking, literally I've taken thousands and thousands of pictures. So there's this tropical uh, coastal cactus forest, then going in through the thorn scrub to the TDF, tropical deciduous forest, where there's just huge amounts of moths. There's just the intensity, of, of uh, numbers of them uh, is, is phenomenal. To transition zones from that into the oak um, scrub uh, and oak uh, grasslands. Uh, and then this is just a big panorama from a, a month ago of uh, on the way into Yekura, uh, right before the monsoons is clouding up. And, and this is that uh, soil that's affected by, um, what's that, the geothermally altered soils. The, clay, the white, where there's oak populations and pine populations. To the tops of the Sierra Madres in that area, which has these very large oaks that are, you know, they're disappearing, it's sadly, uh, uh, some junipers and pines to the top of like Mesa Campanero, lots of rain, moist, uh, tall pines and the, uh, the very big leaf oaks of Coca Loba folia and Magallii and Oh, that other one. Um, and then also the seasons, because moths fly year round. Some uh, have multiple generations, and a lot of them only have one generation, and some, they all don't fly.
fly during the monsoon season. So some fly in the dry season, some fly in the spring, some fly only in the winter. So having to be there at the right time to get them. So this, again, near Yekera, uh, the oak woodlands, uh, uh, end of June, uh, Sierra Mazatan at the same time, and then the uh, fabulous thunderstorms um, that come in. Lots of lightning. This was from last week. <laughs> this picture I was able to put in there. Finally figured out how to uh, shoot lightning. You shoot about 800 pictures. Doing it all handheld instead of doing um, uh, tripod work, which would be easier. You know, take 600 pictures, get one shot. But, but uh, we did, got some nice things. So the wonderful floods that happen. Uh, this is Gert, my ass assistant, who's been working with me from the University of Sonora, who's been in invaluable for helping me translate things. And I tease him and call him the pack mule because we have to carry generators and things up the side of the mountains and all this equipment. Um, so, uh, and this is near uh, Triga Moreno. It was a beautiful, sunny afternoon. Half an hour later, this was a clear, beautiful, babbling brook, and it was this torrential uh, flood and then it disappears. Then everything turns green, and this is a time to really get great numbers of moths. Then this is uh, late September, early October. Things start to turn brown again. And this is early March. This is March of last year. This is my favorite collecting spot, uh, Martha's Ranch at Trigger Moreno. But this is kind of odd because they had a really intense freeze in February, so this doesn't look right. There's a lot of... Uh, uh, freeze damage in that area, and there's still a lot of trees and plants that got wiped out from that intense uh, uh, freeze from last year. So moths are attracted to light, and they come in in great numbers. And this is kind of in the TDF area where they are just, you can just get swamped with them. Um, and also within there is the blister beetles and lots of other beetles, and so it's uh, uh, go in at your own risk. And this is when t what happens when too many come, the sheep, they even tore the sheep down. There's just, that's piles of moths down there. Um, lots of sphingids, so lots of, some saturnids mixed in within there, and then a lot of uh, singular species that are, that come out in flushes that are there. You can see some of the generators and the type of lights. And this is like ideal collecting on Mesa Campanero. The moths are more polite, they're spaced out. You can see what they are, they don't tear each other apart. And you can see a lot of the really beautiful uh, uh, tiger moths, the uh, archaeids. This was from uh, August 14th, 2010, at the height of the season at Martha's Ranch, Trigger Moreno. Up all night, not sleeping, but then it shows part of the process. I sort all the moths, put them in the containers, count the key species. Um, now working with scientists, they uh, make me do all the stuff that I can't stand, keep records, do counts, <laughs> dates, GPS readings, uh, weather, temperature, all of that. So they made up sheets, checklists, and so I've been keeping all this data now, which I never did before. At first, I threw away all the specimens after I scanned them, and after being scolded numerous times, now I have to put pins in them and labels, and, and, and that has been happening too as well with all these things, because uh, apparently I've been finding things that are undescribed, and there's only two or three in collections worldwide, so I'm getting a lot of contact from people, what are, where are these things going? So, Hopefully these are all coming back. They're all in Sonora right now, and they're gonna hopefully stay in Sonora after I'm done working um, with them. So part of the process, um, this is a wonderful woman named Paz, who was my housekeeper in Las Bocas. Um, the people there insisted I had to have a woman take care of me. A man couldn't stay alone. How am I gonna cook? How am I gonna clean? Well, I do it in America. So uh, she had lots of time, and uh, she's a, a, a Mayo, uh, Indian, and she just loves animals and plants, and uh, I trained her to pin the, uh, and mount the insects for me in preparation for scanning. So these are scanned on their backs flat on foam core, so I, uh, a foam, foam board, it's styrofoam, instead of the way a lepidopterist would do it the other way on spreading boards, and that, because I can't have a needle in them. So it takes a lot of patience and, and time to do it just right, and she got to be really good in it. And these are the freezers full of specimens. Um, the containers go right into a freezer, and then I can, you know, up to years later, um, um, 
spread the specimens and they'll still be good. So then they go on boards and then they go back in the freezer because I want to keep them as fresh as possible for scanning. I brought down that year um, two of these scanners. These are made by Creo. They're capable of doing up to 14,000 pixels per inch. And they're also able that you can program in the extended focus, the, the plane of focus. The, on these, the focus is uh, uh, 0.125 millimeters is the depth of field. So then depending on how big the moth is, you could do maybe up, some of them need up to 30 layers of scans before putting them together. And so I had these running um, 24 hours a day. And then these are ones that were done. Those are ones ready to do. And that's uh, just to show you kind of what the process looks like. And then these are just some of the uh, specimens. Uh, uh, Deschema mariannae, uh, another large arcteate. Uh, this beautiful green, this I guess apparently is a really rare specimen. There's only um, handfuls in uh, uh, collections. This gorgeous little wasp moth. Um, this is a also a very um, uh, a rare specimen. There's not very many of them in collections. Uh, then the other whole process that I started doing, I'm working with Michael, we're doing the life histories of the Saturnids first, will be the first book. And within it, we're going to have lots of other information, hopefully like it's never been done before. Whole life cycles, the eggs, the plants, the food plants, the locales, the location, and what the, that looks like. These are scanned eggs from um, uh, da, 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 Cayo, um, Cayo Richardsonii. And this is a brown paper bag. So you can see these huge fibers of what the, is just the brown paper being scanned. And this is an extended focus. And this species lays two different colors of eggs. And why? So Michael is wondering for parasites, like if, you know, to confuse them as they lay eggs, you know, if they go after the green ones or the red, as a, another kind of a, a, a chance to, um, to proliferate. Uh, then, of course, the, from the eggs, uh, most ca caterpillars have five insar, some have seven or more. Uh, but the average around five, so this one's just shed. Um, um, this is uh, Ortherini varana. Uh, and then in rearing them too, these are ones that are about ready to pupate. So going out and collecting them to, for that, and then having them pupate, and then documenting uh, uh, that part of the life cycle. Or they spin a cocoon as this Antheria ocalea. Um, so the kind of a life cycle of one moth. This is a second instar, Cytherendium splendens, out in the field. This is the third instar, how it changes. Fifth instar, and they become like the big cigar size. And of course, a stunning female of um, just a spectacular moth. Uh, this year's collecting season, the, the Saturnus took a big drop. And you know, I'm not enough of a scientist to know, but other than I think that big freeze, a drought right after the freeze there as well, um, that we saw very few of these at the, at the lights when they usually came in in big numbers. Um, so to rear them, you know, we, I brought these, uh, the sleeving material, agricultural row cover, and a sewing machine. We sewed big sleeves you could put around a host plant. Um, this is uh, for Automeris colonon. It's a grass feeder, so I made some cages, you know, figure out a way to how to contain them so that I can go back and get the different instars to image them. Um, and then you had to keep an eye on it, and if they ate all the leaves, then you would have to move them to a new sleeve, like here, I'm doing uh, this, and I always laugh. Everyone from America is like, all right, you're in Sonora, right? you're in Mexico. I said, well, yeah, Mexicans live there, but. Uh, well, what about all the narcos? I said, well, I just dress like this and they leave me alone. You know? <laughs> yeah. And so they, they knew I was out there. That I, was, I was the weird guy. I was the the moth. So, you know, um, I had never had a problem. The other thing is, like, from rearing them, is just going out and um, collecting caterpillars, you know, just walking around. And I mean, this is kind of a common Manduka sex stuff, but of course they're big, gorgeous. Uh, things on Datura um, and finding them to image this beautiful little limacoded about that big 
and the, of course, uh, Megalopigidae, the nastiest sting of anything on the planet. If these would get you, I got stung on the hand once, and it was like a, a really bad hornet that then somebody hit with a sledgehammer. It was a different kind of pain, but they're really kind of cuddly looking. Um, some of the successes, this is Rothschildia or, or Azaba, which is common south of Sonora, but it's rare in Sonora. But it exists there, so it's kind of exciting that Michael tells me I have some of the uh, true records for this being there in Sonora. So, uh, and I was also able to get females and uh, has this spectacular caterpillar and spins this wonderful cocoon. Uh, another one, Antheria, um, and I apologize, I'm not pronouncing all these correctly. I never had Latin, and in each country they pronounce them differently anyway. So, uh, Antheria Montezuma. And this is a gorgeous big Saturna, these big snake heads that come off of it. And I was so excited that, to get that last year and this year as well, that they were still there. Um, and able to rear them. This is an early instar, second instar, and it makes this just fantastic, fantastic caterpillar. So this just went from fourth into fifth. It's not all stretched out yet. And I have lots of video of these feeding um, that, uh, that I show. And then I also did lots of video of it spinning its cocoon and photographing its cocoon from the clear state till they turn this wonderful golden color. Uh, another thing that uh, Michael told me that I'm the first to record, uh, this is Anthria ocalea, and depending on what oak it is, it'll change colors. And uh, I did it kind of by accident, because every time we went to Mesa Campanero where I was sleeping them, it would pour down on rain, start just pouring rain, and I just kind of put them on anything and spread them out. So even with siblings, so this is uh, Quercus abocinta, and they come out this beautiful, um, you know, chartreuse green. Uh, and then on Sictophylla, I'm probably not pronouncing that, they're white. And this is more green looking than it is, the uh, photograph uh, um, brings out more green than actually they're, because the underside of the leaves are white and they hang out on the underside of the leaf. And Quercus arizonica, they're this uh, mid-tone kind of a green. And on Vimea, uh, it, Viminea, it's a slightly different uh, uh, green. So uh, the other aspect, I started scanning all the food plants that I was rearing them to, and I don't know why I scan, if anybody needs some for the side of a building, I scan these at huge resolutions, they're three gigabyte files of really beautiful, you see every little hair, every little piece, and the extended focus, so um, that will also show, and this is the uh, Cytophila, the white, shows the white underneath of the uh, wing, of uh, the leaf. Arizonica, and then other food plants. Uh, Manzanita is a great food plant for rearing caterpillars. Uh, you can put it in a vase, you can keep your caterpillars on it, and it'll last for days, so you can have a vase full of uh, caterpillars on your uh, coffee table or your dinner table. Uh, it's just wonderful. Uh, uh, some other plants like uh, the Lysoloma wilts immediately. So you really have to sleeve it. You pick it and the leaves start falling off. So, but uh, a number of caterpillars just feed on it, nothing else. Um, another kind of unexpected thing that culturally that happened that's really exciting to me is uh, w working and living with the Mayo people in uh, Las Bocas in the Masiaca area. And this moth here is really important to their culture. And they call it the four window wing moth. And it's a very important uh, moth to Sonora. And everyone seems to know this moth uh, and, or know about it. And here's its caterpillar. Um, and that what they, is important is the cocoons. They collect the cocoons and they keep them through the winter and let the moths emerge so they, they can go out and uh, hopefully find the, the food plant. Um, one of its favorite food plants there is the, uh, what's it? Trofa, yeah, there's, uh, that it grows very fast, 16 days from egg to cocoon. It's one of the fastest, and they're big, and it, so it's like, because of that 
rain down there, the leaves are only on a short time, so they have adapted to this. Re on the right food plant, they'll grow really, really fast. So they collect the cocoons, and then they make the in this musical instrument called the uh, tenabaris. And they use that in their uh, traditional dances. Um, so I went out and interviewed, uh, uh, this is Chalo, who at uh, Chivi, he's a Mayan elder and kind of a medicine man or healer. So, uh, and he makes this instrument, collecting the pebbles from pogo nests, ants' nests, getting the right round ones. He then puts them one at a time in each cocoon, listens to it when there's enough, takes one out or two out or adds one or two, it has to sound right, ties them to a strand, and then listens to it again. And you wear one on your left leg and one on your right leg, and they have it to have a different sound. So I was able to record all this wonderful information that a lot of even the other young Miles who wear them, the dancers, they don't know that, but, you know, but luckily he's this elder who's keeping their tradition and making these for them. And then they're wore on the leg like this. Uh, and then there's three of the dancers um, that wear that. This is a Pascola, and they wear the most, as many as 500 cocoons. And of course, this wonderful music. And I, just, I got hours and hours of video of all these different dances, ceremonies, and stuff. So this will be a whole other book, a whole other project, because I, I got some really amazing images. I'm just going to show a brief amount here. The Venado dancer, uh, the deer dancer, he's dancing on top of a gourd. He does lots of tricks. He does lots of flips, rolls, uh, very animated. Um, I've been very lucky that you know, the Mayo kind of welcome people to these. The, uh, the um, uh, Yaki up north, you can't photograph, you can't do it. They're more of a different kind of a spectacle. And they're really different. They, uh, what, there's, um, what they wear, the meanings, some of the, the different elements of the language. Um, uh, and then also the Fariseros, which were my favorite um, through Lent, uh, the 40 day or whatever days of Lent there are. Um, and this is a whole panorama, a, a whole group of them. So that uh, become another project. Um, how much time do I have? Uh, okay, because this is like I could cut off. I have a lot more to show. Um, another distraction was the spectacular sunsets in Sonora, especially on the coast. So this is like out of 130 images. If anybody needs something like 30, 40 feet long, um, you know, uh, it was just wonderful. At every night, I would just stand and take photo after photo because it changed dramatically of the sunset on the coast. So uh, some of the things I've been doing, um, Hemaluka Wallapai is the top row, and starting to do enough scans of different specimens so you can show the color differences of how they uh, blend from a light peachy to this more chocolatey color. The bottom two rows, of, this row is of male uh, Hemaluca tricolor and females. And there's subtle differences, but you know, for Michael as the scientist, that they're trying to determine lots of things in the coloration. And then I got this really wonderful oddball. I, it's never been, it was bright red, so it had none of the dark pigments. And so uh, that was down in Las Bocas. And you can see in the females how the, the color shifts in them. Um, and things I like to play with, putting them together. These are all the green, uh, little green geometrids and six different species of them. The wonderful sphingids. Um, and I spread all my sphingids with uh, proboscis out. It takes a lot more room in cases, but you've got to have this beautiful thin line. Uh, my, one of my favorite drawing teachers, I knew when he came back to see one of my shows, he would always go, when you draw, you have to have that line. And he came up to this one. Oh, look at this beautiful line going down the page. So, and I knew he was going to do that. So it was something, well, I did learn something from him and it's from these fingers. So this one is the, uh, the pink spotted hawk moth, Agria cingulata. Uh, for some reason, I, they're usually pretty common. We didn't get any this year. Manduca ochis, this is from uh, Rio Kuchahaki, probably a willow feeder. Uh, very, very few, and the Manduca rustica, which is all over uh, everywhere, but uh, probably the biggest. And it actually has the longest uh, proboscis and the largest of the two. These, the scale isn't, here, isn't correct here. Some of the beautiful silk moths, the 
Anthera ocalea, uh, Holophora gloveri, and again the uh, Rothschildia cincta. The Arsenea, these two, uh, uh, Caio richardsonii, which was the first eggs I showed. Um, Desimonia borealis, wonderful, what is this? Bone at the end of it, it's just great. Uh, little tails that the male has, female has less, and of course the splendids. So doing the male on the top, female on the bottom. So trying to get, uh, you know, both uh, sexes. And then things of variation, these are both uh, male um, uh, Copaxa lavendera. And they range from this beige to this really bright orange with pink flecks through it. And there's an intermediate ones all in between this. Uh, the female is really consistent in color, it's very beautiful, and it's yellow with this gold thing. And, uh, and some, just some little moss, a beautiful green knock to it. Makes the Campanero area. Um, this one, I don't think this one has a name yet. This is a Gonodonta species from San Javier. Um, it's in that kind of family of the vampire moths, or closely related, that has those stabbing uh, proboscis. And just gorgeous, gorgeous uh, color. And this amazing scales, which you miss in this, each of this is really crisp, gorgeous focus of all of that. But this one, that uh, thorax, is just really spectacular. Each scale is lined in color. Uh, I don't know what this is, but it's a little archaeid <laughs> from uh, near Alamos. I only got one. So sometimes it's like you get one, and that's it. And then, so, and what is that? So those are the labial palps, and then what are those for? And why are they, one scale is that long, and why are they tipped in gold? As I, you know, I don't know, no one can answer that for me, but, uh, but isn't that weird? But that everyone says these is not two, it's with these amazing palps. Some kind of scent organ, some kind of, you know, hearing organ. Uh, the gorgeous wasp mimics. Um, this is the one that um, both a wasp mimic and it also communicates with the bats. So I, I can't remember if this is the one that uh, one of them, one species uh, kind of jams their sonar like so they can't hear back. And the other one answers back saying, I taste bad, I taste bad, I taste bad as they fly. So the bats hear them and stay clear away because these are uh, foul tasting to them. Uh, the gorgeous uh, hepialets, the ghost moths, the primitive moths, uh, two species. This one's a giant, you know, just gorgeous and this luscious pink. And this one only got one uh, at uh, Trigger Moreno, haven't seen another one. So, uh, the Automeris is a really fun group. These are three different species. This one has, is quite variable, it could be orange or bright yellow like this, Automeris colonon. Uh, Automeris budoodiana, and this is Automeris iris dradiana. And I think Michael's working on it. Some people say it's the same species that we have in New York, uh, but we brought down some New York uh, uh, females, and the males of Sonora just were not interested at all. So um, either it's just slightly different, but in their size and everything, there's a lot of differences. So um, it's probably a really different species. Little luscious little green geometrid. And then the cats. And this is wonderful. This is just a, a Sphingocampa hubbardi, but the Sphingocampa vary the number of these sphericals on them depending on what food plant they're on. Uh, if they have really tiny leaves, they'll have lots of them. If it's something with uh, bigger leaves, they'll have very few. And how they figure that out. A really beautiful uh, uh, Eocles oceri, Pamima, Automeris Pamina. Uh, Colorado uh, uh, percoli, a wonderful, uh, you know, almost impossible to see on pine bark, you know, there. Um, uh, and Olivia Azara, this is the Lysoloma feeder, so these leaves are really tiny. It's only about that big, the caterpillar, it's kind of a smallish moth. And these are just some different arcteids, 
Oh, this is an early instar of the Percoli. I should have had it next to the other one. Um, there's Manduca sexta, the big juicy. Eat a lot of tomato plants, zero tomatoes. Early instar on Amaris uh, randa. This is a wonderful thing from outer space. Uh, on manzanilla bark, I just love this because of the gorgeous color of the bark and then this amazing thing. Backlit, uh, different species, the uh, archaea. A megalopidget, another one of uh, stinging caterpillars. A little archaea, one of the, they call them the uh, woolly bears. Oh, and then, uh, well, this is, a, we can keep going. I just threw on some cactus. Love these uh, wonderful, cool winter, produce these beautiful, vibrant purples in this, that. Uh, uh, cactus. Got to experience a bloom of um, Penoceres uh, striatus. One night of the year, thousands of blooms. So just, I waited every night going, checking all different nights. I didn't know they bloomed close to the evening. Then finally, I was I just stayed up all night and got lots of these wonderful, that's a or, uh, organ, organ pipe, uh, a dead organ pipe on the side. And, and they were quite variable in their petal shapes and forms. And then, of course, working with uh, Francisco, he said, was telling me that the fruit of the Cardone is like five different colors, so I got to get pictures of that. And we also, uh, they have four sexes, the flowers, so we had a, I scanned all of those, cut them in half so that we we're going to have that information to show um, uh, the four different sexes of Cardone flowers, too. So. And then we went on trips to watch the bats pollinate the flowers of the Cardones. And this was just uh, another spectacular 10-inch flower of uh, Salinas series vegans that grows in the arroyos near Chichibohora um, uh, in southern Sonora, close to Sinaloa. And just to finish up some eye candy of these. Different. This is Copaxa molarana. Uh, caterpillars are s impossible to rear, so I got them. They hashed, was feeding them on the oak, went from Yecra to Mesa Campanero, not hot, cool day, eight kilometers. By the time I got to the Mesa Campanero, they all died. But everyone has tried to rear them, and they said they're extremely difficult, so I don't know. We're gonna figure out on the book on how to People have done it, but um, I haven't had luck with them. And this is just the last image of this. Megalopigidae that has this wonderful fur. And this is a huge, probably a new species. Um, it's black and pink, and a, it's a kind of a large one. So that is un, from an undescribed one. That Michael reared this one. So that's it. There's time now. This was, um, you know, originally was SciTech. Then they were bought out by Creo. Then Kodak bought out Creo, which is a disaster. <laughs> you know, because Kodak is, and Kodak are just impossible to work with. They're in Rochester, New York, just up the road from us. And you can't, they won't pick up the phone, they won't talk to you. They'll probably discontinued it, but I still keep um, in contact, luckily, with the, the original engineers were Israeli, and they're really nice, got very excited by what I was doing, gave me the beta software, started developing the extended focus, which was something they programmed into this, but never told their, you know, the owners of the scanner what it was capable of doing. When I started doing this, they got excited, it gave me the software. They were really expensive when they came out. They were like $90,000. Now you can find them every once in a while on eBay for you know, 10 grand uh, down to 
for the ones that you need to three grand in between there. Uh, and I have five now, I think, uh, you know, for parts and that. And to keep them, when it's heavy going, I have them going 24 hours a day to, to get through the images. It's, they're slow. They're not fast. How wide can the object be to make the sky? How deep? The deepest? Yeah. yeah. Um, hmm, I should know that right off. It, depending on what model, there's three models that will actually do the extended focus. And on the best model, I think it's about 20 centimeters. Wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. No, 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 not 20. Um, inches, centimeters. Uh. It's 10 millimeters. Two centimeters. Yeah, it's two. Yeah, yeah. It's not, yeah, it's not all that, yeah. Two centimeters, yeah. So yeah, not 20, 20 is, is you know. <laughs> No, I won't do that. <laughs> that means the, the scanners we use every day is also getting these other layers. Yes. But we don't have the software to see them. At first, uh, there wasn't any software to put them together. And that's where me being an artist, I would spend weeks on an image drawing in Photoshop around the focus area, copying, pasting it on top, erasing, blending, and, 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 and moving it, and drawing it back in. So a lot of those were all done just by my uh, insanity of being able to sit 18 hours a day and, and do it. Now there's software that works 60% uh, ish. So you still need to go in and do a lot of cleaning up, adjusting, and I figured out lots of tricks and things of doing it like, oh, well, that doesn't work, try this to get them to do, but it speed, speeds it up quite a bit. And uh, it's right in Photoshop now. Do you have a book for postcards, postcards? Oh. And are you yeah. planning on using your videos for a yeah. Uh, I apologize. I have a book back at the hotel, and um, Dr. Sarkhan said, did you bring it? And I forgot it there. But I have three books have been published about my work. The first one is uh, uh, Night Visions, and it's a big coffee table uh, book. Um, and it's here in Mexico City, uh, I, I believe. But uh, uh, Francisco uh, Molina said he's seen it here. Uh, but that's, that, it's out of print. There's a green one called Mothing. And it's, uh, again, it, it was for, uh, part of a catalog of the show at University of uh, Arizona at their art museum. And it has like five authors, and I wrote it, I had them write about the five different senses in moth. So smell, touch, taste, um, and, and sound. So that it's written from a really different perspective. Some of the people are artists, some of the people are uh, scientists who wrote the essays. And that's all Arizona moths. And then I have another one that's called uh, Night Flyers, which is printed on or, uh, oriental paper. Um, and that was a limited edition. So that, and I made tons of postcards and I didn't bring any of them with me. They're all up in Tucson. So I could have, maybe I could send videos, something. Do you have a documentary or? The videos, um, I show them at museums and galleries as these installations. So it's more installation, but. So right now they're not available in any way like that. And uh, if I had more time, I would have a better website with lots of more stuff. But that's one of the goals with all these different species and stuff and how that's going to evolve. That's one of the things to get done. I had a website for a number of years, but it became so much work, it became outdated. Crazy people were always contacting me. And so it was like, because uh, of the thing, I would get like, um, poems sent to me and things like that. I, I saw God in a moth, and would you tell me if you like my poem or not? Like, <laughs> I'm making a quilt, and I want to use your Luna moth. Can you send me an image of the Luna moth for my quilt? So I'm thinking, oh, you know, how do you keep up with those kinds of requests? So, so I work with galleries, and I let them, I, they have their websites, and my work's on those, so that gives me more time to work and less correspondence. So. Uh, you, you don't show the legs of the moths. Uh, I used to do that. Um, but then um, the underside of most of the moths are very cryptic. And it's not 
You know, for every rule you make about a moth, there's going to be ones that break that rule. You know, there's no real rule that says how a moth is different than a butterfly that works. But the other side is it's usually not as interesting, but then again, on some are really amazing. So I haven't uh, then positioning them and spreading them so you could do the both sides. I, I guess that would be better suited for photography than the scanning. I was thinking, could this replace scientific specimens? Um, uh, I don't, you know, people have been trying to do that with 3D modeling and all of that. I don't think the technology is there enough that you can see the whole specimen where you really need to see the uh, dorsal and the retro and the legs and the joints and that. I think that, uh, you know, when you do the 3D scan, it's all video res, so it's lower res yet. It's improving quite a bit. But is enough information there yet for you to really get there and then you need to see something that you need the microscope, you need the specimen, you need to really look to really see it. Um, for the front side, yes, but for all the other parts, um, I don't think it's there yet. I'm sure it'll be at some point, but I think it needs to still improve quite a bit, and we need bigger computers and bigger file sizes and all of that. Uh, I know some people are, are trying to do the 3D modeling of all the type specimens, but you know, how, how really useful are those? Um, I'm not the scientist, I would, you know, need to, uh, you know, to hear from scientists to say that it is, so. Uh, Yes. I went with Francisco to um, uh, the Santa Series Gamosa and Kino Bay, and those are uh, photographed by Sphingids, and we spent a night with those glorious, beautiful flowers and the big Sphinx moths flying in, and um, you know, being there at the right time, and you know, it's a, a lot more work. And of course, there's some cacti that are only pollinated by one species of moth, so the is really important. I know Francisco, every time he says like, oh, you got that great cactus fly. Did you see what pollinated it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's another thing that actually we'll be working on more of the pollination with moths. And, um, I've been working with Steve Buckman um, in Tucson on that. Um, I always like when I do the spidgets, I clean all the pollen off them and he wants <laughs> like no, that's you know, it's messy. <laughs> yeah, so. Muy bien, no sé si ya no hay alguna otra pregunta. Quiero agradecerle a su presentación. A par de veces dije que iban a tener un rato deleitable visualmente y realmente no creo que haya sido este. Decepcionados. Esto, su trabajo es bellísimo artísticamente, pero también desde el punto de vista naturalista, todo el trabajo que toma está estar cuidando, consiguiendo, cazando, todo este material realmente requiere de mucho conocimiento del campo, de mucha paciencia. Y estos son elementos realmente importantes de un naturalista. Uh, Vamos a explorar también las posibilidades de colaboración, de colaborar en algunas cosas. No sé qué, ahora que ven, este, pero sería lindo empezar a tener algunas de estas cosas acá y animar gente en México que se vaya a colaborar con que en serio estas nuevas formas de ver las naturalezas son realmente espléndidas, que no son triviales. El trabajo detrás de hacer esto es. Esto no es nada más una instamática, ¿no? es mucho trabajo que está involucrado y consecuentemente pues, también mucho, mucho mérito artístico para poder hacerlo. Uh, le agradezco mucho, Joseph, thank you very much for the presentation, for your time here. Thank you. Ah, oh, beautiful. Ah. Diploma. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. It's beautiful.